Hi, welcome to the Metaverse Brands Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen DiPianco. Today, we're welcoming back to the podcast, David Taylor from Novik and Super Social. David wrote this excellent article called the 2022 UGC Games Playbook, where he outlined how Metaverse platforms like Roblox and Fortnite Creative are investing their resources into creating great content, empowering their creator communities, and engaging with brands. This was our first podcast after a brief hiatus, and I'm excited to get back into these fun conversations. Thanks so much to all of you who've been listening along, reading my work on my website, metaversemarcom.io, and following on LinkedIn. An extra special thanks to those of you who have signed up for my newsletter. All right, let's jump into this conversation with David. All right, welcome back to my guest, David Taylor. David, welcome back to Metaverse Brands. Thanks for having me back, Stephen. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to to catch up with you to to talk about more of your work. Um, you also just want to acknowledge you're the first guest to come back for a second time. So uh, very excited wow. to bring you back. I'm honored. Let's talk about uh, UGC Games and some of your thoughts you've created around. UGC games. So just to set things up first, can you just set the table for like, hey, when you talk about UGC games, like what are you talking about? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's always important um, to define some things. And UGC games is just essentially uh, platforms that create tools that allow for, you know, consumers or consumers with some, you know, development capabilities to create their own uh, games, uh, and so for the for the most part, this has always happened for for many years with modding and sort of uh, players really loving content and wanting to adapt it to their own needs. But in the last you know 15 years, you know when since Roblox has has started, um, it's become more intentional around you know it being sort of an open ended process of create any game you want with the tools that we're providing. Um, so when we talk about UGC games, it's like user-generated content, but it's focused on games. Gotcha. And so, and then for for those listeners who you know again might not be super familiar, what are some of the sort of top UGC games platforms that that come to mind for you? Yeah, Roblox is obviously the biggest one. Um, Minecraft is probably the second biggest one. Um, and as far as uh, the creator ecosystem, and then third largest would be Fortnite Creative. All of these sort of have very di- are very nuanced in sort of the tool bases that they use, but they all have this um, offering where you know users can basically build their own games using the tools that they these platforms have provided. Gotcha, and yeah, it's like I I, I think about when I think about UGC that term, I think about like YouTube right? Like TikTok, like sort of video. Um, This is sort of in the same spirit, but like instead of creating a video, for example, I'm creating a whole game. Yeah. And I think there's a lot like that is a, that is a fair comparison to make. And also UGC games are just an entirely different beast in the sense that it's a lot more complicated to create a game than it is to just upload, you know, a video that you just created. Right, right. Anybody can just like whip out their phone and suddenly they have like a TikTok account and a TikTok video versus having to build a game. And just, yeah, briefly, like, how hard is it to build a game? Do you know how hard it is to build a game on a UGC platform? Uh, It depends on the game that you're building. Uh, You know, some, you know, some uh, Roblox creators can make a game in a day. You know, but it's a very contained game, Mm -hmm. very simple game mechanics, not a lot of environment, uh, not a lot of art. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, if you want to build like a game that resembles uh, a AAA game, but, you know, using the UGC tools that you have, that could be, you know, a six to 12 month process. Some games have even been in development for, for multiple years because they're so ambitious. So it really just depends on, on what you're trying to build. Cool. Well, thanks for thanks for setting that up. Now, so you wrote this article, UGC Games Playbook, um, and so uh, in that article, you outline 
uh, a number of sort of recommendations. Um, before we dive a little deeper into what those recommendations are, yeah, what sort of spurred you to um, to create this article to begin with? Yeah, so uh, as you've you've read, you know, I've been writing these deep dives on each of these platforms. Um, so the ones that I named, also Rec Room, uh, Manicore Games, also are sort of uh, you know newer companies that have entered the space. Rec Room for VR, Manicore Games is sort of uh, competing with Roblox and Fortnite more directly. Um, although they have some interesting Web3 capabilities that they've introduced around NFTs. Um, so I've done deep dives on these on these platforms, some new, some more established. And as I've been doing these deep dives, sort of asking the question, all right, you know, this company is taking this action. You know, Roblox has their game fund. Fortnite Creative is uh, introducing an entirely new tool set for their for their player base based on Unreal Engine. Uh, Rec Room has now uh, done a partnership with Unity to to use their Maya tools to import 3D art into the into the platform and make it easier to do more high fidelity graphics. So each of these uh, platforms is taking these actions that require a lot of work. And so then the question is, okay, what are they what are they going for? Why are they mm. investing so much mm-hmm. in in these various initiatives? And that's sort of where I got to after doing these deep dives and asking those questions, I start to see there's these patterns where there's consistent, uh, you know, actions that these platforms are taking in order to further their platforms and compete with one another. Right, right. It's sort of like follow the money, follow the the resources. Where are they? Where are they investing in order exactly. to to get ahead? Yeah, that's yeah. very very cool. Very cool. All right, so so let's jump in and and look at this at this list and go through each of them. Talk a, have a little conversation about each of these points. So, the first one was around adding new creator tools. So, what did you mean by that? Yeah, actually, before we jump into that, I just wanted to sort of highlight, give a sort of high level framework for sure. for what each platform is going after. So, essentially, like each of these is pursuing a flywheel effect, mm. right? Where it all starts with great content which attracts players to the game. And by attracting players, that attracts spend, it attracts an audience, and that gives creators, developers, a reason to create. And when they create, they create more content, which continues that flywheel effect. Right. So essentially, it's great content, great content attracts players, attracts developers and creators, attracts more content, and so on. And so for each of these sort of playbook elements that we're going to go through, they're all sort of insertion points in that flywheel. They're Mm. all trying to bolster one element or multiple elements of that flywheel because each one supports the greater platform. Got it. Got it. And just as a, as a, to understand a little greater the context, typically across these UGC platforms, uh, the UGC creators are there are ways for them to monetize is that right uh yes early on it's very difficult and this kind of goes back to the the flywheel uh element which is that you need players on the platform to incentivize creators to create so there is sort of a cold start problem with uh purely ugc platforms and that's why roblox has taken so long to get where they are today they've been around for over 16 years but they were purely focused on building tools and so it just, you know, it grew very slowly, but now they're the largest, right? Whereas right. you compare that to Fortnite and Fortnite Creative, which has only been around for, what, five years. And they're, you know, similar scale as far as player base. And the reason is because they had Fortnite Battle Royale, uh, which attract this massive user base. And then, uh, you know, part of that user base um, moved over to Fortnite Creative once there started being content for them to play up to the point where it's now 50%, or at least that's what they claim, right. um, of total play time on, the, on Fortnite. Got it. All right, so, so within the context of that, of that flywheel, of, of sort of spurring growth across different parts of the business, um, where, yeah, so where does adding new creator tools uh, fit in? Yeah, so adding new creator tools, I mean, 
when when uh, each of these platforms is sort of competing to get these creators who build uh, content for them. And uh, when a creator is deciding, you know, which platform am I going to build for, they're thinking about, well, <clears throat> what am I, what are my own technical capabilities? Uh, and can I build on this platform? So one of the key strategic decisions that any platform has to make is how accessible are these tools going to be? And it's a trade-off because the more accessible a game is, the more easily people will be able to get started, but the more challenging it will be to retain those players because, you know, what we call in business school talk is uh, high switching costs or low switching costs. So if it's super easy to get started, it's super easy to leave. Mm. Whereas if it's hard and it requires you to spend hours and hours learning a new tool, you're more likely to want to stick with that tool than just move on to the next thing. And so that's why it's sort of a, a strategic decision. And so, you know, you start with your initial tool set that will be, you know, more accessible would be like uh, Fortnite Creative, where, you know, you can just start building with a Xbox controller mm. uh, versus less accessible, which would be like Roblox, where you need to learn their coding language, Luau, in order to get uh, started building games. Um, and so... Uh, you, you know, you have that starting tool set. And then the next question is, well, what additional tools can we add to either deepen the experience for existing creators or make it more accessible for new creators in order to onboard them into those more difficult tools? And and from, from what you've seen across these different platforms, like how aggressive are these platforms at, at rolling out new creator tools? Um, you know, to, 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 to those ends, whether it's to retain or whether to, it's to expand, you know, how much of, is this a focus? Yeah. So it's hard to know just in terms of their, these companies priority stack, but, mm -hmm. uh, we've obviously seen the biggest example is the immense, uh, uh, initiative for Fortnite to essentially introduce a new coding language, uh, for, for Fortnite creative creators, um, which has been delayed and delayed and delayed over the last year. I think it was, I can't remember ex exactly when it was supposed to launch, but I think early last year. Okay. And it still hasn't launched because it's just such a complex initiative. Um, so it's obviously a huge priority and it's really difficult to do. Got it. And And the idea, part of the objective is to really sort of, I guess in, in by delighting and sort of satisfying that creator base, you're hopefully locking them in, right? Like making them loyal, you know, having them be invested in in building on your platform. Yeah. And I think that's not the primary reason. Okay. Like that's one dynamic. The primary reason why these platforms add new creator tools is because they're help, trying to help their existing creator base make better content. Mm. Uh, so that's what Fortnite Creative sort of new new tools are all about, is it just recognizing the depth of content that players can create just using you know an Xbox controller is fairly limited, right? right? And so right. how do we make it so that uh, there's a lot more exciting content that will attract those players, right? Because ultimately everyone at, at the end of the day what's most important is that you have great content on the platform and the question is how do we how do we get that great content because everything else follows from there gotcha so better tools you can make better stuff um awesome exactly. so so all right so then moving on to the second second part of your second recommendation in the UGC games playbook it's really around uh, so funding tentpole content. So where does this where does this fit in? Yeah, so we we've spoken to a little bit already with Fortnite Battle Royale, right? It, this wasn't them funding tentpole content; it just was the tentpole content that led to the creation of their creator platform, right? And is why it's been successful is because there were already so many players on there, and and then creators were excited to build for that player base and. You know, some have been able to make money, though, you know, I would say that their creator economy is, is a bit stifled by the current structure of it. Um, mostly streamers have benefited from uh, from the uh, creator economy rather than the actual map builders themselves. Mm. Um, but but this is all changing, hopefully, in the in the coming months or years with all the changes that they're making 
uh, from a, a tooling perspective. Um, so, so you can either start with temple content, which is something you see a lot. GTA five is another example, right? Where you got this massive player base and, and now there's like a considerable modding community who are sort of doing alterations and having their own fun GTA esque experiences. Um, but then if you're not, you know, leading with, with, uh, a game that's transforming into a UGC game and you're just a UGC platform like Roblox what you see is actually having a fund mm. uh, and paying uh, paying players to make, sort of push the boundaries of, of what's possible rather than sticking with, with what's safe and what's reliably an income source. Sort of saying like, we'll fund this game. It's a little bit ambitious. It might not work, but we'll pay for it because we want to, to um, expand on what's possible in our, in our ecosystem. So it's it's sort of like, again, like you're saying, it's not exactly, I mean, in the case of Roblox, it's not a cold start, right? So they have a ton, they have a huge ecosystem, et cetera. But they, Roblox was a cold start. But it was they a cold start, were right. Much, much more mature at this point. <laughs> right. So at this point, though, they, they just want to maybe accelerate that content development, that content innovation. Uh, so with that fund very much... I, you know, I think of it in terms of like Hollywood, like greenlighting a project, right? Like saying, yes, let's go make this project. We think this is going to be successful um, in terms. Of, and it reminds me about 10 years ago, 10 plus years ago, YouTube, when it was trying to professionalize, trying to not be seen as just a platform for cat videos, went and cut big checks to a variety of different publishers, different celebrities to launch channels to produce content in order to, yeah, increase, you know, both the quality and also I would say the perception of, of the platform. Um, do you have a sense of like how these um, sort of game funds either work or how they've performed? Have you gone deeper into any of those areas? Uh, I don't, haven't looked at performance. Um exactly i and i'm not sure because i'm sort of under the hood whether i can share sure exactly how the game fund works but from a public facing perspective um it's really you know they look for uh exciting new concepts yeah uh, so there's sort of a pitch element uh that's primarily the way that that it works is you you come to them with a with an idea and they'll green light it or or not Cool. You apply. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes sense that, uh, that again, like that's such a, everything kind of ladders back to that quality content. So the more that they can, to your point, whether it's arm creators with better tools to create better content or directly invest in, you know, creating that content, you know, having partners create that content, it ties back to the content. So, all right, moving on to to the next part, uh, enabling um, enabling brands to fund growth. Uh, yeah, tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, I think Roblox, Fortnite are prime examples of this. Uh, although Rec Room, which is a, a smaller platform, although still pretty sizable, uh, just had to announce a partnership with the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially what this comes down to is um, brands obviously have a large interest in these platforms based on the number of players that are there based on sort of the the demographics on those platforms younger audiences are obviously very exciting for brands because you know the sooner you can get uh, a potential customer engaging in your brand the sooner you can convert them to being a customer the longer the customer lifetime value is so it's a really exciting uh marketing uh uh, platform. And so, um, you know, they come interested in, 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 in that exposure and they come with, you know, fairly significant checkbooks that they're willing to write in order to, to get that exposure. And what those checkbooks do is, is are, they're obviously immensely valuable for creators because, uh, it's hard to be a creator. You know, there's so many creators on these platforms that if you really want to make a living doing these things you have to be you know if it's rec room you have to be like the top creator like number one <laughs> the top creator is the only one who's making a living uh where if it's roblox you know you have to be the top uh you know 500 uh or and so 
these brands come along and they're and they're willing to to work with these creators to fund these uh, marketing activations, and they do a lot for the ecosystem to sort of bolster the amount of revenue that these uh, studios and more organized creator studios that uh, can make. Yeah, and and I, I really like how you how you frame that um, one in terms of like so again if I'm putting myself in the shoes of Roblox or Fortnite right and I'm saying hey I want to have great content and uh, I want to support the creators who are making great content. Well, I can't necessarily fund every great creator <laughs> out there to 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 make that content. So if there's a very healthy, vibrant brand ecosystem where brands can pay creators to create work, then that hopefully is doing a couple of things, supporting those creators who are, you know, doing great work, but then in an ideal scenario is also producing that great content that keeps people on the platform. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's a great summary. Um, and yeah, hope you hope that they can create uh, great content. But as we've seen on Roblox, I think there's been obviously you know fantastic activations that get a lot of impressions. But as far as you know, the type of retention and engagement that you want to see on on a typical game on Roblox, I think that's where brands have have had some challenges on on really uh, retaining players. Yeah, for sure. And that's and it, it, I think there's probably tons of reasons why that is and, and including the fact that it's just not easy to make a really good game. Exactly. Um but but uh yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, just the role that bland, brands have to play uh in these spaces. I I was talking to um to a, another previous podcast guest who who really alluded to the fact that like brands have wanted to engage via gaming with you know gaming audiences however it's really with the sort of rise of UGC platforms that have really cut down on the friction on the barriers for entry for a brand to like really get in front of these audiences you know before you're looking at just like maybe longer development cycles longer you know, longer approvals processes, you know, less opportunity. But now it's just like, oh, a brand could, in theory, stand up a experience in a, in a couple months, you know, on a Roblox in a way that they, you know, couldn't before. Yeah, I think a big part of that is actually sort of the transition to free-to-play gaming. Mm. Uh, like, <clears throat> if you play, paid $60 to play a game and then you saw a bunch of ads... right in the game you'd be very upset with the developer uh and so i think that's why it was very much taboo to, to have uh -huh. ads in games before and and but when you're playing a game that you haven't paid any money for sure. you're you're much more uh willing to to put up with the with the occasional ad the occasional branded experience and uh yeah i think that's why you know free to play games have so many players in them and why advertising makes a lot of sense for them. And my son just wants to download all of them. He's like, can I get a new <laughs> game? Can I get a new game? All the time. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so moving on, uh, platform, platform expansion. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So platform expansion really refers to just moving your game from whatever you know its its native platform was, whether that be on the PC or being mobile or being console game to other platforms, right? Um, Rec Room started as a VR game, right? And that's then they've done an amazing job there. But in order to sort of grow their audience, increase their player, uh, attract more players, they moved to mobile, and that was a huge boon for them uh, as far as as far as growing their audience. Um, and so that's just. You know, it's not super complex. It's it's part of every right. game's playbook, not just UGC games. Um, but it's really about just sort of growing the the potential market for for the games on the platform. Gotcha. Distribution. Got it. Got to go where the people can access it. Exactly. All right, and then and then last one, moderation. Yeah. So moderation is one. It's a hot topic right now, um, where uh, you know it's a, sort of a key question of how much. Do you moderate uh, 
the the games that these creators are making right mm. if anyone can make a game anyone can make a really inappropriate game uh and so i think that the challenge here is just you, the 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 amount of cost associated with really sort of being bulletproof on the moderation side and making sure no one gets exposed to inappropriate content or you know Roblox just unlocked uh, voice chat, right? Right. Anyone can say anything now on voice chat. And so how do you protect people from from being exposed to inappropriate content or inappropriate um, behavior on these platforms? It's a real challenge. And so um, as far as that flywheel where this fits in is really attracting players. So parents are always thinking about, well, which platform is safest for my kid? Where are they not going to have to deal with in like content that I don't want them to see or could be potentially uh, harmful in in a psychological sense. And uh, every platform sort of takes a different approach. Minecraft has taken an approach of like a sort of, uh, they approve every UGC content that comes through at least Minecraft Marketplace uh, before it even gets exposed to players. Whereas Roblox takes the approach of anyone can publish anything and then we'll just take it down if it ends up being inappropriate. And this is an important choice because Minecraft has had in the past between two to six month approval times wow. for some of their UGC content, which is really damaging to a creator's business. Uh, a lot of this, a lot of UGC content is really driven on sort of these uh, uh, media trends. moments. Yeah. Trends. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, and so if you're if you you're made something and then it's two months later when it finally gets released, it's not going to be that relevant. All right. Um, but on the flip side, they've done a really good job of being known as sort of the safest platform for kids. And so that's a trade off that they have to make, whereas Roblox has taken a different approach. They've gotten a lot of flack for different things that have uh, different inappropriate content that has popped up from time to time on the platform. But uh, they have an incredibly healthy uh, creator economy, the most healthy one. And so it's just a, it's a strategic decision that, that these platforms have to make. Yeah. That's uh, again, reminds me YouTube has, has taken so much sort of hits in the past, right. For lack of safety and, you know, rolled out YouTube kids and, you know, all of these issues of safety, especially when you're dealing with, you know, younger audiences, minors, um, that becomes just, yeah, super important. It seems like uh, it's expensive. It's very expensive to build the safeguards, um, especially if it's, you know, if you can't, if those safeguards aren't automated, right? Like if you need a lot of oversight, if you need a lot of people power to make sure that things are actually that are actually being, you know, safe and appropriate, et cetera. Um, yeah, huge, huge, uh, huge undertaking. Yeah. I think I saw somewhere, and don't quote me on this, even though we're on a podcast. <laughs> uh, I think I saw somewhere that Roblox has over a thousand people who are moderating content on the platform. Oh, wow. So it just goes to show how much of a, how, how much of a lift this is to, to do effectively. Right, right. It's one of those things things it's sort of like good hygiene right it's like it doesn't like necessarily get all the headlines or whatever but it's just so critical to you know because you just don't want it to blow up in your face you don't want to have a controversy you want to avoid you know having being known as that like unsafe platform and on the on the roblox voice front i had watched a tiktok video with this sort of prominent Roblox TikToker who some yeah like creepy guy was talking to him like on Roblox and it's recorded it's on TikTok and it was like let me hear your voice like this guy you know it was just like so creepy and then the TikToker like pretended to like have like a female voice and was like playing along and then like flipped it on the guy and was like hey what are you know blah 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 but it's just like yeah, that's funny, I guess. I don't know. It's just like more like, oh man, I bet this happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure it doesn't happen all the time, but I think the fact that it happens at all right. is is unfortunate element. And, and frankly, I'm not like I'm not entirely sure why 
voice chat is a thing <laughs> <laughs> like should like you know apex legends they're they had this big innovation sorry i'm going way off the no rails here but sort of one of their their big innovations was around the ping button mm. which is like a way to communicate with your teammates around what you want them to do by just pressing the right bumper and the reason why we're so innovative is because like now you could do a team game without having to talk to someone and deal with all the toxicity that yeah. you know these multiplayer games can be uh can can have as, as part of their experience and honestly it's a it's a great game because of it yeah and i and i think it's just worth noting like within the context of yeah, just other like brands that are interested in these spaces, right? That there's, hey, warning, right? Fair warning that there's, to your point, toxicity. Like these are these are things that, uh, that are just part of the conversation, that are part of the environment. Uh, you know, often for worse. And again, there's ways to manage and to be aware of it, but just to like, better to know these things ahead of time versus like you know, kind of be blindsided by it later. Yeah, 100%. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was uh, was really great. Just in terms of wrapping this up, you know, any sort of final sort of takeaways, thoughts on, you know, UGC game platforms and uh, what you, you know, what you think is uh, effective for them um, based on, you know, all the work that you've been doing in this space? Well, I know. I just think given this is... Uh uh focused on or for brands i think you know just re reiterating that these platforms are fantastic opportunities to do brand marketing and i think that brands should invest more in in these experiences just because they are really engaging they are fairly cost effective ways to engage with players um they can lead to youtube streamers you know engaging with this content which just further amplifies what these uh, brand marketing initiatives are for. So I think it's it's super important for every strategy. And you know what's nice as a as someone who works for a studio, you know it also is really good for the creator economy as well. Very cool. For people who are interested in keeping up with you, following your work, where can they check you out? Yeah, I think just on LinkedIn is my is my main my main spot. So uh, find me, David Taylor. I work for Novik and Super Social. Uh, follow me, add me as a friend. Uh, it'd be great to have more people checking in. Cool. All right. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks so much, Stephen. Have a good one. You too. All right. Thanks again to David. After talking to David, I think what stands out to me is really just understanding the importance of great content. That's what it really boils down to. That's what players want, what creators want to make, and what platforms need to make their businesses run. The better the content, the larger the whole ecosystem can grow. All right, thanks so much for listening. If you like this episode, please be sure to subscribe, leave a comment, and rate it. If you want to follow along with me, you can check me out on LinkedIn, Stephen DiPianco. You can also check out my company, Metaverse Marcom. We help entertainment and sports brands enter the metaverse with strategy, innovation, and marketing consulting services. Our website is metaversemarcom.io. You can see our research that we publish there, as well as sign up for our Metaverse newsletter. All right, thanks so much. I'll see you in the metaverse.